Welcome to the Animal Training Fundamentals Podcast, where we have fun with practical application and we get mental with the science of behavior. Put them both together and you get results, solutions for your behavior problems, and the tools you need to achieve your training goals. I'm your host, Barbara Heidenreich. Let's talk training. Hey guys, welcome back to another podcast from AnimalTrainingFundamentals.com and your host, me, Barbara Heidenreich. Super happy to be back with you again. Before we get into this podcast topic, I want to say we've got a winner. Remember I said we are going to reinforce all you wonderful people that review our podcast. And we do have a winner. Rating and reviewing our podcast helps bring it up a little bit higher in the search engines for those people who are interested in topics like animal training. And of course, we want more people to have access to this information because, you know, we have fabulous guests on the show and people need to learn from them. And so guess what? But our winner is SF Elephant. Yes, that's you. You are the winner. You get a one year free membership to AnimalTrainingFundamentals.com, which is an amazing online educational resource for people who are looking to learn more about behavior and training, non coercive ways to train animals to cooperate in day to day care, medical care, participate in educational programming, um, conservation programs, everything you can possibly think of. And it's all there available for you to learn and work on your professional development. So SF Elephant, go ahead, reach out out to us. Um, You can reach out to us through animaltrainingfundamentals.com and we will confirm your information and get you all set up. And you know what? We're going to continue with our program. All you have to do is rate the podcast, rate and review it, I should say. You do have to review it in order for us to be able to um, uh, get in touch with you. And, um, And the way to do that is go to animaltrainingfundamentals.com and it's a backslash podcast and you will see a big green button that gives you information on how to do that. All right, well, let's get into this episode. We're going to talk about marine mammals and I've got two special guests with me. These are people that I've known many, many years. We kind of started out together and they went on into marine mammal training. We're, we're going to talk about what are some of the really cool marine mammals or at least our favorite favorites. And we're going to talk about some really amazing behaviors that have been trained. And we're also going to talk about what's not so glamorous about working with marine mammals. So lots of interesting details here. And of course, the most important question to a lot of people out there, how do you even become a marine mammal trainer? Because obviously, these friends of mine went one direction and I went a different direction. So how did that happen? How, how did they end up becoming amazing marine mammal trainers? And I went in a whole different direction. So lots of great information for you all here today. So stick around and let's find out about marine mammals. Hey, it's Barbara Heidenreich here with two more guests. We're going to talk about marine mammals today. I've got Andy Farias and Maggie Gonio. Hey, welcome. Hi, Barbara. Hey, Barbara. <laughs> My dog is here making lots of noise because he wants his butt scratched during this podcast. So you have to forgive the interruptions. <laughs> It's going to be a fun one. All right, so let's get into it. Let's let's talk about. Um, well, first, I should tell everybody how I know you both. We we started out way back when. We have to go way back in the time time machine here. We worked together early in our careers at a zoo, actually in what was back then the children's zoo, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What did we work with? What kinds right. of animals? Oh my gosh! Help me remember. My tail program. I was in the bird program, so I was under you. So that was actually my well, my first job at a zoo. I had done some volunteer work and an internship, but that was actually my first job, a seasonal job working there. Oh, that's right. It was a seasonal job, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. I, it, oh, and that yeah. was my second zoo job, actually. Maggie? It was my first zoo job, but I had been working with um, animals, I had worked at a vet clinic. I had gone to what I thought was going to be vet school. However, I was offered the position at the zoo while I was interviewing at vet school. And and which uh, I went that route. And which vet school? No, which uh, which area were you in in the children's zoo? Were you you were oh Clydesdales? That's right. Yes, and I loved Ben. Ben was my favorite Clydesdale. Oh, he was such a good old guy. He was. He was a sweetie. 
Yes, he was. Awesome. Yeah. And we did the, we did a presentations in the summertime, as I recall. Did, yes. Yeah. yeah. But from there, um, I ended up going down to Florida, but you guys stuck around and somehow ended up marine mammal trainers. How did this happen? Well, Andy, you first. So, yeah. So I, you know, I, I tell people that I, I didn't ever, I never started out to become a marine mammal trainer. I really just, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do to begin with in life. I was a bio major in college and I just loved biology and I was not in the pre-vet or pre-med or pre-pharmacy or any of those pre-tracks. Um, but, um, and then sort of decided like, well, working with animals, that would be cool. Where could I do that? Uh, oh, zoo, maybe I could work at a zoo and got some experience and then uh, did an internship. And then from there got this, you know, seasonal job at, uh, in the children's zoo, you know, and here I am working, you know, you know, a few weeks later, I've got a hawk on my arm. I'm like, whoa, this is pretty cool, you know? So, and that was also my first introduction to training animals and um, hadn't really given as much thought. I just thought, well, I want to work with animals. Um, I'll take care of them, you know, and I'll do a good job at that. And that would be a cool career to have. Um, but the more, the more I learned about, you know, animal training and, and the things that the really cool things you could do, um, you know, first it was very basic stuff. Animal goes from one point to, to another point, A to B, the whole thing. Um, but um, after a while, you know, I worked there for a little while, uh, actually worked in the commissary for a little while just to get some more experience in the zoo. And, and it was another job. And then I got hired back in the children's zoo uh, full time there uh, a couple of years, later, you know, like a year later. And then was got really involved in the training of all of these different animals that we had in the shows. So and we had a lot of domestics. You know, we had dogs, we had horses, uh, we had, you know, trained goats. Uh, but then we had some really cool stuff. We had some raptors and red-tailed hawks. We did have a few set of scenes, a macaw, uh, you know, some smaller parrots. Um, so a lot. It was great because it was a great variety of animals to work with. So I feel very fortunate to do it. But again, I, you know, uh, the things that we were doing were pretty, were cool. But, you know, I just kept, the more I was trying to find out, the more I was realizing that how much I didn't really know about training and that I really wanted to, 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 you know, to learn more about this. And this is really cool stuff. And there's a lot we can do with this and not just training animals to demonstrate behaviors for people like in a show. So, um, you know, eventually a job opened up over in the Marine Mammal Department working with uh, dolphin seals and sea lions and walrus at the time. And, um, and I thought, you know, they really have it down. They really know what they're doing over there. They have a very, you know, uh, established program and uh, in training people in the science of training. And fortunately, they took a chance on me. And, um, and I kind of, you know, I've been in that, in that area ever since. And it's been, of, you know, 20 some years later, uh, I'm still working with green mammals, which I love. Uh, but I also really like working with animals in general. So that's sort of my story in a nutshell. Maggie? Well, um, as we are sitting here listening, I recall Andy and I started on the same day back in the day <laughs> at Children's Zoo. We did, we did. Uh, but again, I we did, yes. Visit April Fools, <laughs> kind of around there, but um, you know it was uh, kind of the same story. That wasn't the direction as far as you know animals. Yes, and and I thought I had this direction heading you know towards vet care. However, learning that there's so much more uh, available to animal care and um, a lot of a lot more um, roads to take beside the the medical aspect of it and once I started at the zoo uh it's very similar to to Annie it was just such a great um kind of way to be with animals and people and and work with all those together it was just such a great um you know partnering so um I did start in the uh kids zoo children's zoo with the Clydesdale program and that was great. I had a lot of great uh, mentors there. And uh, full-time, I ended up uh, moving over to um, 
where did I head next? Oh, over to the mammal department. Uh, and that was a lot of different uh, small mammals and Australian mammals and, and as well as like reptiles and birds and things, um, uh, other species within those areas. And, you know, it was interesting. I loved working with the animals, but in the same way, you know, the training was a little bit different back then. And, you know, it was not as prevalent in all areas, right? So wanting to introduce and, and learn more of that in some of the areas was sometimes a challenge because you, it was kind of more known, the training was more known in, in the marine mammal industry, but wasn't as uh, known in other areas parts of the park, such as, you know, larger mammals or small animals, you know. So uh, I was able to, it was a, a great opportunity opened up for me to be able to go over to uh, the marine mammal area and do kind of a temporary uh, position there. And that was really great. And then of course that really, you know, oh, wow, we get to train all the time and do all the, you know, there's time allotted specifically for the training, you know, whereas other areas you might have to kind of sneak it in or, you know, um, kind of talk it a few people into helping you out to train. And, and then it, it did change. A lot of it opened up. Um, a lot of areas are now doing more training, but at the time, uh, that's where I headed was, uh, um, after a few areas of, of, um, terrestrial mammals and avian in other areas, I went to, um, marine mammals. And so that was, that was a, a really great place, uh, to lay the groundwork for, you know, the actual science of, of training and consistency with the team. And, and that's where the real kind of marine mammal training um, took place for me as far as really getting involved in hardcore training. <laughs> so um, yeah, and that's, oh, after that, then I, um, I worked in a few different areas with primates and other large mammals and um, headed on out to do some consulting in various parks and uh, aquariums and zoos and, um, yeah, I've been in the animal field training in other capacities along the way. So what yeah. different species? Oh, sorry, Andy, go ahead. I just wanted to add. So um, I, I, to me, this is significant to me, Barbara, you were the one who introduced me to the book, Don't Shoot the Dog by Karen Pryor. You had said, hey, you want to learn more about training? I said, yeah, I do. This is, this is really cool stuff, you know? And, and of course I read it and you know, truly one of those life-changing moments for me, you know, and I, and since then I've read it over and over and at one point got to meet her in real life, which was, which was pretty cool. Uh, but it, you know, it tells her story. She was in marine mammals and all that. So. Yeah, I think for a lot of us, that book certainly was that first eye-opening moment where we went, Oh, Hey, what's going on here? I can apply this to a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, for sure. So what, um, what were some of the species that you worked with? I know you mentioned some, Andy, but maybe there were some others as well. So, uh, I would say the majority of my career, um, I've worked with bottlenose dolphins, um, California sea lions, harbor seals, uh, walrus, um, we, uh, gray seals, uh, northern fur seals. So um, some, we did have some birds, too. We had Inca terns. We had... Uh, um, and I, some uh, ibis. We had uh, we actually had a hawk for a while. We had Eric Sock for a very short time. That was that was fun. Uh, so those are you know most of the animals that I've worked with for most of my time. But throughout my career, I've been fortunate enough to do kind of what Maggie was alluding to. Like I would do, hey, you know what? Uh, there's a, a, somebody that has a, a you know, a leave of absence, either to have a child or something like that. And they need some help over this other area. Would you be interested? And, and, and I was able to take advantage of those opportunities. So I've done several of those. And uh, so I've got to work with primates, uh, orangutans, gorillas, uh, gibbons, uh, you know, otters, uh, uh, pangolins, uh, you know, lots of different things. Uh, and then I, I did some in the, the newer area where they have a lot of ambassador animals, so servals, lynx, uh, they have wallabies, uh, uh, prehensile tail porcupine. If you've never met one, you should meet one. They're probably maybe almost the most adorable animal I've ever seen. If you've ever seen one, <laughs> they look like a little, like a cartoon. If you've ever seen a, if you're not seeing one, look it up. It's a prehensile tail porcupine. I had never met one before. 
and just kind of one of the animals that stole my heart. Uh, but they had sloths and they had some, you know, again, birds of prey and some, uh, um, you know, lots some other domestics and that sort of thing. Um, and then I got to work with some cats, uh, a clouded leopard, a caracal. I mean, I could go on and on and on. But um, again, I've been very fortunate that I've worked, got to work with many, many different species. I've um, always learned a lot from each one of them. Maggie, what are the ones that you were, um, <laughs> I was starting with marine mammals, to be honest, but we can expand upon that for sure. Uh, sure. Within uh, my first park, I worked in, uh, in many different areas. I was really fortunate in, in uh, openings, you know, not that you ever learned everything you could in one area, but there was always somewhere else that had an opening or an opportunity to learn a little bit more and work with different species and different people. And fortunately, you know, you learn from all the different areas, you learn from animals and the people. So um, it was, you know, large, you know, terrestrial animals, I mean, um, okapi and, and river hogs and buffalo to, um, you know, like opossums and um, trying to think of some of the, any of the small mammals, bats. That was my, one of my first training uh, uh, projects was a, a fruit bat. But moving from there into other parks and, and venues, um, you know, it's just working with um, introducing training to, to various people and, and just the, the good fortune of being able to share a lot of information amongst parks and um, departments and, and, you know, moving into different areas was always really helpful in, in gaining knowledge, both from the species and, and the, and the the people in each of the areas. So did you want specific species? I mean, I, I guess pretty much I've been really fortunate to, they were, you know, finned or feathered or, you know, um, hoof stock and there's aquatics. And, you know, again, I'm just very fortunate to be able to, to work in so many different areas with um, lots of different species. You know, I, I've been very, very grateful for where I've been. Well, what I was going to um, ask, especially since kind of bringing it back to marine mammals, is is really kind of the differences between some of those marine mammals, because I think um, they get lumped together, you know, like people say, oh, well, you know, dolphin training, sea lions, seals, walrus, you know, what's the difference? But I would imagine as somebody who works with those species, that there are differences that that people would want to know about. And especially, you know, when you think about it from a training perspective, you know, for me as an animal trainer, I always think there's all these little different things that I do that I'm aware of, or that I'm thinking about from a technique perspective that, that I have an awareness about when I'm working about with those different species, you know, yes, maybe the principles are the same, but there's, there's little things that I want to think about and have an awareness about when I'm working with different species. And, you know, I, I don't know what, you know, what kind of pops into your head when you think about dolphin or sea lion or seal or walrus, any, anything? Um, I would say, you know, you know, I think people ask probably, you know, to be fair, people ask mostly about my dolphin experience, although they're interested in the other stuff when we get to it. Um, because they're just, you know, there's one of those species that everyone just seems attracted to. They're, you know, they're interesting, they're intelligent, they're fun. Um, and I think probably one of the things that struck me the most about when 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 I started first working with bottlenose dolphins is, you know, I'd worked with quote unquote social animals before, but you know, dolphins are you know, I don't know how to say this any better than saying really, 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 really social, you know, animals. And that most of what they do is, you know, is interacting with the other animals in their group. So that's a big challenge right there when you're working with a group of dolphins. It, it's, it's true for any group. Um, you know, I won't say that there are other animals, especially primates, you know, highly intelligent social animals. Um, but dolphins are, you know, you really have to be careful when you're working with them in a group, you know, you, first of all, you have to have uh, enough people to keep all of the animals occupied. You can't just work with one while the other ones are, are sitting idly. They're going to come over and, and disrupt whatever training or, or stuff you're trying to do. Um, and what you're doing with one animal may very well affect what you, you know, what's going on with another animal. So there's has to be a lot of coordination when we're working with the dolphins about who's going to work what, um, maybe in what area or in what area of the pool or in what pool or, 
if it's a higher energy behavior or a lower energy behavior or, um, or, and even socially, you know, where that animal fits, you know, in the, in the social hierarchy too. So I, I think that's a, a, a really big uh, factor when we're trying to think about, you know, okay, I'm going to work with this group of animals, these, this species, how am I going to best, you know, work with them and, and accomplish what I want to accomplish. And I think, Going along with maybe in general, um, you know, the fact that, you know, with dolphins, I can, you know, it's the old protected versus protected contact versus free contact. You know, I can work, quote unquote, free contact under certain circumstances with our dolphins, but I don't work with them all the time that way because I'm obviously sitting on a deck and they're in the water and, and you know, we're asking them to, them to do certain things. So, um that's that's sort of dolphins because I think that's one of the more popular ones. I can talk about other ones. But. What do you think, Maggie? Step that you would add to that about dolphins? I I think a, a, a I'll piggyback off of what Andy mentioned as and being social in in the groups. Um, it's another thing to um, some of those animals that we work with in the marine mammal field are raised in a situation of training um they're right as they're born we're training them and we're working on um reinforcers and we're a positive and we're you know it's kind of a um it's an accepted daily practice and it's it's what you know um those, those animals grow up knowing and learning and 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 training is a daily activity with them other areas that um sometimes that isn't quite the case. You, you are introduced to an animal that's just never even seen, you know, working up close with a person, you know, that, that isn't as comfortable for them, or, um, they're, they're just learning how training works. You know, obviously they know how it works, but I'm just saying, you know, in a, okay, we, we bring you in a right way from the herd, or we, even if it's a solo animal, it's still kind of teaching the animal what it is we're about to do with them. And, and, and the teaching is starting at a later stage. So, you know, that's a big one too. Um, I think the various area used to how to introduce this animal to training. I'm, I'm thinking actually of a, a buffalo we had. And, you know, for her, this was just such a, a novel thing. And she put probably about 15 years old or so, you know, and, and now we're going to start doing husbandry training with her. And we thought, well, this is great. You know, we're all yeah, let's do this. Well, of course the animal's looking at us, you know, like uh, that just isn't as comfortable as we, you know, you move from marine mammals who are, are they grow up in this type of situation and training and, and that's, you know, um, they learn, they mimic from their, their aunts and their moms and, you know, that mimicry is going on and they're, they grow up in it. But in other areas, sometimes you're, you're, you're kind of put into a situation or the animals put into a situation that now we're going to be doing, you know, look, let's build a relationship and let's do, you know, all these kind of, um, whether it's, you know, all of a sudden we need medical care that we'd like to train and have cooperatively trained versus, um, other, other ways. Uh, so it's, it's another kind of, um, introduction, I guess, in training, you know, it's when I first started training at, at, with marine mammals it's this is how you train and this is how we train them and and it's a really nice program in other areas where it's just starting out um you know you you might be introduced to animals they have no clue about that um uh, situations and you know the teams all of that comes into play you know i think that's a that's another big one so you know and again like the the primates are social as well so there's separations that you're dealing with or you know um team training kind of things. It, it, it's a lot. It's, it's just, there's so many different ways to, to, to view training. Um, you know, and that's one of the differences that I can say is big with, um, the marine mammals. Is it just a, a daily accepted, you know, program and then the, the babies grow up in it. Whereas others, other species, you might not have that luxury. So going back to your question, Barbara, I think, you know, I've kind of maybe, I don't know if this is part of your question, but I've, I've felt people asking this before when they talk about, you know, you were saying sometimes they group all marine mammals together. And I think I have found that to be true too, you know, when chatting with people and I think everyone kind of, because I mentioned dolphins first, because that's usually what people talk about. 
sometimes people kind of think tend to think of everything's like a dolphin, and that of course isn't true. <laughs> um, you know, work again. I work with walrus, um, who are you may think that because they're large animals that maybe that they're slow moving and they're maybe not as intelligent. That's absolutely not the case. They're extremely <laughs> intelligent and, and extremely adept and at um, and, 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 you know it, it physically doing things. They're amazing, even though they have this immense size. Um, working with a couple different seal species, I remember I had worked with harbor seals, and again, seals as a species tend to be a little bit more skittish. So when you're desensitizing them to something new, you know, it's going to take longer than it is probably with a sea lion and definitely than with the dolphin. Dolphins tend to like sometimes novel things, depending on what it is. Um, and then we got gray seals and I go, and they were sort of an order of magnitude, even more um, hesitant, you know, for new things. Um, we, we had these you know, two animals that, you know, for when we got them in, we'd never had them before. Um, they picked this little corner of the pool and that's the only place they would eat for for about a month <laughs> and that, but they did find they they flourished since then and you know and eventually we work with them and they build a trusting relationship that you always want to do um but again those are some you know some sort of basic differences you want to add to that maggie <laughs> no pressure no, i think he, he explained <laughs> the, the green mammal aspect of it pretty well i again you know the people do definitely want to know about the the dolphin training and they are lumped for sure um but you know again like we've mentioned there's there's just so many even within the dolphins there's differences but again you know and moving on from that each each area you, you add on you know like, each species, each individual, they all have a, a, something different to, to add to your <laughs> training yeah. session, yeah. for sure. Um, what about behaviors that you may have um, trained, either one of you? Was there something that was kind of interesting that you, you trained in the past or, or maybe, you know, was trained with an animal that you worked with before you got there or after you got there? Um, any any behaviors that you think are kind of cool? So uh, I think, you know, there's obviously lots of them. You know, I've, I've been doing this for 20 plus years. You know, I've been doing this a long time. So uh, throughout my career, I've trained many, many, many behaviors. Um, some of the ones that come to mind, one of the funner ones that I I guess I'm I'm proud of all of it, but I, this was because, you know, I don't think of myself as a superstar athlete, you know, but we do go in the water with their dolphins and we do fun stuff with them. They push us around. I always say the dolphins are do all the work. They're the ones that make me look good. I'm, I'm not a, you know, I, I'm not an Olympic athlete, um, but I trained uh, what's called a stand on. So basically uh, I'm in the water and I ask the animal to go underneath me and they, I push it straight up um, by my by the bottom of my foot but using their rostrum and then kind of hold it for a second and then I go straight back down. And the reason why I was, you know, from a training standpoint, it was interesting. I had lots of challenges, but I was also, you know, we were both learning at the same time. So it was one of those sort of unique experiences where the dolphin that I was working with, we neither of us had done this before, <laughs> was training a brand new behavior for both of us. So we were kind of learning together and uh, trying to figure out, you know, what to reinforce or what to, you know, what's more important as far as moving the behavior forward and, and keeping it all fun and positive. So that's one of the funner ones that I've done. Um, you know, some of the more, I think, impressive things that we've done is uh, we've had an animal that needs to have um, not just a normal blood draw, like 10 or 12 cc's, uh, we call it phlebotomy, but up to a liter uh, of, of blood for, for medical purposes. And this behavior can take 20 to 30 minutes and the animal will sit there for 20 to 30 minutes with a needle in its tail while we voluntarily take blood out of it. And of course, you know, we all know this, we couldn't do this without the cooperation uh, of the animal. So that's, you know, to me, that's one of the more impressive behaviors that, that I've been around in. And I have to say, you actually allowed me to watch that procedure one time, and it was that's, quite that's impressive. Probably. You did. You happened to be there on, on Fleb Day. We call it phlebotomy. Fleb Day, you know, <laughs> everyone loves Fleb Day. So. Absolutely. So there's a couple of things. I could go on and on, but, uh, you know. 
Maggie, you get to share. Right. Well, I can. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, the blood one, um, you know, we work with all kinds of animals, as we've already, you know, uh, said, but I worked with um, one of a walrus that um, did not have, she was blind, right? So, you know, that in itself, working with her, learning a lot of trust for her, you know, she, she, you have to kind of work with them and build that relationship. And it's really critical, um, especially for some of these medical behaviors. And one in particular was a lumbar, um, basically drawing blood from um, a pretty, you know, difficult area to, you know, I would say, uh, gain that trust. And, and it took a little bit, but being able to get that was such a huge, huge thing for her, um, you know, medically. And for me, it was just so astounding that this huge animal would just hold still for us to do that um, and hold still for that amount of time. And, and she did it willingly. And it was just, you know, that was an earlier on in, in my career, like, wow, this is just something, you know, building those relationships and, and being able to, to, you know, they're allowing us to, to work with them this way. And it was just such a, a real, um, I don't know, it was just such a stunning moment of being able just learning what we can do again, like Andy said, in this cooperative sense, you know, it was definitely all her allowing us to do that. Um, and, and some of the other behaviors for me are that are really key are, um, kind of experience behaviors when people, um, kind of work with us, uh, the guests are able to kind of interact with the animals, um, in a safe way, but you know, that, that, you know, I think sometimes we are so lucky and and able to do the the, the work that we do, uh, and and letting people in on that and see what we do and see what uh, why our work is important and all of those things and and really when they come in and they're involved in it, uh, kind of takes it to a different level. And so I I think any of those kind of interactions uh, and experiences uh, are really kind of um, important for me. You know, that's for me. I think that's a really great. Um, avenue for people to come in and kind of learn about what we do, learn about the animals, and it kind of sticks with them. They remember that because it's just such a huge thing for them. Um, and one other behavior, it wasn't one behavior, but it was kind of a um, working in kind of a large savanna setting. Uh, animals, we all know when it gets temperature, you know, definitely makes a difference for them seasonally as well as just on a you know, daily when it gets hot, animals kind of tend to to rest and find shade. And that's not always what um, our guests are looking for. <laughs> they want them out front and center. So uh, a series of behaviors we worked on as a, a, there was a team I worked with was increasing movement of animals. And so we would kind of use um, maybe a mockingbird sound and the ant learned that if the mockingbird was present, you know, head towards the mockingbird and there'd be, you know, some extra treats over there and it increased movement across a savanna. And so doing that with different sounds and different animals uh, was really interesting to me because the, the the power of training, you know, that they like would just think, oh, I'm going to head over to this area. And it just added so much to the exhibit. And it involved people being able to see our animals and, and why the animals are there, you know, learning more about the animals and their presence made a big difference. So just interesting to me. Uh, there's just so many different ways you can manage the training, you know, um, medically uh, for guest experience. There's so much open to us. It's, it's um, uh, each one of those behaviors uh, kind of makes a difference for me. Um, I just wanted to add, so maybe and I'll ask both of you guys, Barbara and Maggie, you know, I think for me too, like some of the more memorable, almost, you know, a lot of the most memorable behaviors are, are animals that, you know, were a real challenge to work with, that there was some sort of obstacle, you know, with, with building a, re a rapport or a relationship with this animal. Either they, you know, were, you know, they, they just lack trust uh, with a human partner, you know, yet, or it, they're just one of those animals that was just really, you know, had to work really hard to get them to trust you. And, and once you did, you know, even if it was the smallest behavior, how, how good that made you feel. I, I imagine both of you, you know, have had that experience many times throughout your careers. Absolutely, yeah. I love when we see, um, when you're almost training, training trainers to train and, you know, you're teaching. And for I do remember one moment where, you know, we were working on this behavior for, for quite a while and, you know, 
uh, it was a struggle and a struggle and a struggle. And, and so I would, you know, they asked, Hey, what, what do you think about, you know, we changed a few things up and the, the first time that this individual did get the behavior from these animals, um, the, the trainer turned and was like, ah, I don't need you any longer. And it was really funny. You know, it was to me, that was the epitome of why we do what we're doing. You know, we're training, we're helping others, you know, we're teaching the training and then she'll go on to continue doing that training. And, um, it was just really rewarding for me to, you know, to kind of, I, yeah, yeah, we're, we're done with you, you know, but you've done what you were asked to do, you know, and that's a huge thing when someone can now take that torch. And, and, and so that was a big one for me. Yeah, that was, yeah, I, agree. I agree. The challenging ones definitely stick with you. Andy. <laughs> and, and I agree as a consultant, you know, you're, you know, as much as you love training, <laughs> and we all love training as a consultant, your, your job isn't to go there and train the animals for them. It's for them to learn how to train. And so it's very, very reinforcing when, when they get it, you know, the people that are, you're there to teach. So, yeah, but yeah, definitely, uh, um, uh, getting that connection too. Um, but I think what I'm finding is that I, uh, I start figuring out, um, the procedures that are, you know, I start learning more procedures, you know, learning how to use my tools better so that I am doing it better the next time and the next time and the next time so that I'm understanding better how to, how to make that connection, I think is what I start realizing. So that I'm, I'm I become a, a more effective trainer the next for the next one and the next one. And the next one. <laughs> so it's pretty cool. We're going to take a little break to give you your first secret word. And the secret word is walrus. Secret words are important to remember and submit to show you have listened to this podcast for your professional development. If you're a member of animal training fundamentals.com listening to podcasts are required for earning certain badges. All right. Back to this episode. So, um, how about any surprises? Have there have there been any situations where an animal's really surprised you with, like a you know, I, I always remember that story of, like, um, uh, I think I thought it was a dolphin story, and I thought it was from uh, your facility, Andy, where. Or maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. I could have just, you know, matched <laughs> facilities that with another facility, but where, where a dolphin was trained to like collect things that had fallen into the pool and bring them, bring them back to the trainers. So, you know, like a, a retrieve to clean up the pool type of thing, you know, like if a guest, you know, accidentally put something in the pool. And so a dolphin was actually like storing stuff so that it could rip off little pieces so that it could bring back more pieces for more opportunities for reinforcement. <laughs> has, um, has anybody got a story like that? You, you know, um, I don't it's remember fun. a specific dolphin story like that, but absolutely at, um, in the primate area, there was one of the, one of the older, uh, the, the grandmother, um, she would do that. There was, I remember I, when I was working there once, there was a cell phone and give you an idea how strong they are. And she's breaking off pieces of this cell phone. <laughs> and then she'd go to the, you know, the small window that they could do and she'd get, get a retreat. And then a little bit well later, she, and then she'd sit down and keep breaking it in pieces and, and doing it, kind of that sort of thing. Uh, Cause again, they knew that they were going to get something for, for pieces. So. Yeah. Another um, primate individual um, with between the shifts opening and closing, you know, again, it's, it is cooperative, no matter what you are thinking, <laughs> it is cooperative and it's definitely on them, uh, their choice. And, you know, one is the trading of that, you know, like, I'll just hold on to this and give you bits and pieces, you know, what else, what are you kind of handing out there? But another uh, situation is, putting um, items in the way of a shift, you know, so everybody's going out and they're not quite sure they don't want to commit to the shift. So, you know, they'll put something in the way of the shift and then go into that area, kind of check it out, or maybe even like, you know, oh, I'll take this piece here and then run back through the shift. You know, they're just so brilliant. You know, you just have to always be thinking what can happen and it, you can't, you can't think enough, you know, all, all of a sudden they're, they're putting things in front of the ship so that they can help themselves to the buffet you put out, you know, 
Um, and again, you learn from that and say, okay, well, we won't put everything out, you know, hold back. So it's just interesting that, yeah, they, they do surprise you all the time, you know, just when you think you, you have a handle on it. And like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> uh, we did have two dolphins that um, figured out working cooperatively. This wasn't a trained behavior, obviously. We didn't train them to do this, but we had manual gates. So you have to pull up a lever and then swing the gate. And then there was a pin that went through the other side. And uh, there's two two dolphins. It was a mother and daughter team, actually. And they figured out they couldn't do it by themselves. But if one of them kind of pushed on the pin a little bit and the other one lifted up at the bottom, uh, they figured out how to close the gates. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so much so that we actually had to take the gates out and have them modified so that they couldn't, you know, the welders, add um, a piece on it so that they couldn't do this anymore. So. <laughs> That was certainly a big surprise. Nice. So what are what are some of the um, favorite behaviors of the guests, do you think? Like, I, I know, like, one of the behaviors I love that I, you know, with the with walrus is the vocalizations. That's always pretty impressive. Yeah. It's funny, Barb, one of the first ones I... I anything that could get them wet. Oh, getting them wet, yes. That's, there's a walrus one where we would send her over to squirt. So when you said walrus right away, I thought, oh my gosh, that's, that would be my first one. You know, they just, it's unexpected, you know, you send her over and, and she pops up and they're all like, wow, look at that. You know, all of a sudden she's squirting water all over and they just love it. You know, it's just so much fun, you know, so and then, but then also kids. the the suction thing, you know, that's pretty cool too. Although I guess, you know, you'd have to be up close and personal to know about that going on there. Yeah. Yeah, that was a fun behavior we did when we when we had the walrus um, is to demonstrate it. Again, we were, you know, people, the public was a little bit far away. So, but we did talk about it, um, but we would have them suction onto a ball and actually pass it from one walrus to the other just to sort of demonstrate that, that powerful suction. Yeah, I don't, I, I mean, I, I find them like way more, interesting for some reason than dolphins and and i don't know why like other people don't feel the same way why aren't you just like going oh my god the walrus you know yeah, yeah. i feel the same way if you knew a walrus you would be I, uh, an absolute walrus fanatic for the rest of your life and yeah. i still am you know they're just so interesting and there's just so much to them and, i uh, talked to the trainer the the trainers or the keepers of those wal the walrus you know you you might get that that information you know i think looking at it from a few different sides you know it, it, um, presentation wise you know the, the dolphins are very smashy and very um engaging so you know people love them but um the walrus i think on the other side when you're working with the, the individuals they are just you know unforgettable the relationships you form with the the walruses boy they're characters <laughs> Yeah, if, if we have time, I have a little walrus story. It wasn't actually at our facility. We had had some work done, so we sent them out to another facility. And the facility where they were at, they had an indoor and it was climate controlled, but they also had a like long hallway that was outdoor and they had outdoor pools. Uh, one of our walruses was still young enough um, that uh, she could fit through the bars. Um, so she could kind of go in and out of the... <laughs> Of, of the different pools and visit the different animals. Um, and they had um, the door at, at the hall, at the end of the hallway was uh, sort of a, a, you know, a half door. So it had two, a top and a bottom to it. So you could split it in half and they would just, you know, latch the bottom half. Well, this walrus actually figured out, she'd climb out of her pool down the hallway and uh, it was a big, heavy metal latch. I remember seeing it. And they told us the story when we went to pick them up to bring them back. And um, they actually, again, had to modify their door. Is She figured out how to open the door and and, and let herself into the uh, into the exhibit whenever she wanted to. So then they, after that, they were, for a while, they are like, okay, well, we'll just, she can have access to everything pretty much, except when we really need to, to close this off too. And she also figured out because there was a light switch in the hallway she would turn the lights on. So when they came in in the morning, they'd go, oh, she's up. Look, the lights are off. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
And just to, I mean, you said she was young then, but just to remind yeah. people, how big can a walrus get? Like, just so that people know. Oh, well, well, I mean, you know, our female was uh, around a little under 2,000 pounds, you know, and, her, and then the males could be, we never had a full-size male there, although, well, we did, actually, should, I should say that we did, you know, we had them on, on breeding loan, um, our almost 5,000, you know, four four to 5,000 pounds, uh, an adult male walrus, just enormous. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. And fun. And fun. And fun. <laughs> five tons. Five ton, no, wait, that'd be four, two tons of fun, two and a half tons of fun. Yeah. I remember we had, you know, we had those uh, really big, heavy duty pieces of PVC fittings that sometimes you, you give as enrichment, you know, but we had, uh, I don't know, this thing was huge and heavy duty. And we gave it to them in two pieces. And one day we came back and they had smashed them together. And we never, and that became one toy that we never got those two toys apart. <laughs> they created their own enrichment. Yep. Marine mammals are all the same. <laughs> yeah. no. no, 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 no. Fun. No, they're all fun. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so we are talking about the fun stuff here, but um, so but people do tend to, I think, glamorize, you know, working with marine mammals. Um, so, what are maybe some of the not so glamorous things about working with marine mammals for those who are, you know, thinking that's the life for me? How about smelling like fish? <laughs> you <laughs> ever get that <laughs> smell out of your hands and hair? The two tons of fun, <laughs> you know, when you feed, it comes out, you know. So there's always that. Be prepared for that. Um, for for myself, I had uh, um, over a long period of time. Uh, sometimes the water, uh, salt water, can have quite a reaction on the skin. You know, so you just have to be aware of that as a potential uh, workday uh, situation. You know, wearing a, either band aids and and gloves and those kind of things, um, even after work. You know, so. Um, there's that, but I don't know, everything else, you know, of course, going into the animal care field, it's, you know, physical and it's emotional and, um, but by and large, it's, you know, great teamwork and, 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 uh, you know, good fun. Yeah. I guess and I would, mention, you know, if we're talking about some of the things that aren't so fun, um, the things that you have to sort of, you know, endure are, uh, with wearing a wetsuit, you know, it's fine when you're in the water and it's fine when the water is at decent temperature. But if you are not in the water, which sometimes happens and it's really hot, um, <laughs> keeps all that in. So that, you know, that's a little, that can be hard on you sometimes. Uh, fortunately, you know, I've never had to wear it for too long. But uh, um, yeah, having, having fish scales. So you come home at night and you've got uh, fish scales on you know, on your arms that, that you didn't quite get during the day. <laughs> so, Do we want to tell the rocket juice? <laughs> uh, sure. Sure. I guess we could, you know, I'm sure people can handle it. So uh, we had a really cool behavior where uh, two dolphins would uh, push you by your the bottom of your feet and they push you to the bottom, bottom of the pool and then straight up in the air, called it the rocket ride. Lots of fun. Great. Everyone loved it. Um, and then, but usually throughout that process, you need to get a little water up your nose. Um, uh, and, but it didn't always come out right away. Sometimes some would come out right away. So sometimes when you were home, and then sometimes if you, especially if you did more than one rocket ride in a day, which, you know, we had four shows a day some days and, um, you know, you'd go home and then you'd be doing something and lean over and then water would come out. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to explain to your spouse and your children or whoever's there that uh, it's okay. I'm not, you know, my brain is line, out. In the line of things. <laughs> okay. And so I, and I was serious. Can you get the fish smell off your hands? I mean, I know people talk about like lemon juice and those steel soap bars. Does it work? Can you get the fish smell off? So here's what works to get fish smell off. Use the Comet Cleanser, but you don't, that's pretty harsh. So you don't Comet want to Comet Cleanser? Oh, man. Yeah, you don't want to do that, but it actually does get the smell off. Um, what I found recently is if a little Dawn, if you, whatever hand soap, if you put some Dawn in there, that helps because it has a little degreaser that kind of helps. Uh, but 
um, when, especially when my, when my kids were little, um, I would come home and they would say, they would run up and go, do your hands smell like fish? And then they would smell my hands and they go, yep, it would smell like that was your test. <laughs> sort of the daily routine for, for many years. That was sort of the fun thing. Smell dad's hands. <laughs> How hard dad worked today. Right. Yeah. And he did actually do something during the day. So. We have we have told people that it isn't, you know, all all fun and games, that you know, there's some hard work involved. But if somebody does want to go down the pathway of becoming a marine mammal trainer, and we know they're out there, there always have been people who want to work with marine mammals. Um, what advice would you give someone who wants to get into this field? I would um, say, you know, lots of flexibility and patience. Uh, it does take, you know, a lot of different routes to get there sometimes. You know, I, I know that... Sometimes people have a, um, a direction they want to go, and that's great to have that goal. Uh, but along the way, sometimes, you know, when we're interviewing or looking for applicants, uh, candidates, it's we want to know that they have the capacity to work with a lot of different species and a lot of different um, kind of situations. Uh, you can't just come in and say, now, you know, I'm, I'm a dolphin trainer. You know, you, you kind of, you have to, to learn about animals and behavior in general, and then kind of start heading that way. Uh, but one of the things, um, a, a big one is um, just the ability to um, kind of, it's going to take a lot of hard work and perseverance. You know, you're just going to have to kind of keep trying. It's not an easy field to get into. However, you know, once you are in, if that's your goal, you know, it'll be well worth the hard work getting there. Um, but be ready to work in different areas prior to to that specific area that you want. Um, and and a, a big one is it's not just an animal field, it's a people field. You know, so we were, you know, we love our animals, but you also have to be able to work with people very well also. So that's that's what I would I would tend to let people know. You know, it's there's a lot of different routes to get there. Yeah, Maggie, I would agree with absolutely with everything you said, um, especially, you know, the, the last thing about the team, you know, there, you know, I like to think that I do a good job at my job, but the only reason, the only way I can do a good, you know, do well and be successful in my job is that all of these other people next to me are also doing their job well and successful and supporting me and supporting each other. So that's a really, that's a really big skill that isn't often talked about. Um, to go back a little bit, I'll give you my kind of my standard answer. What I would love is, you know, a lot of times after a dolphin presentation, you'd go out and then there would be a parent that came up and they would say, my so-and-so, you know, son, daughter, whatever. And usually they were like sort of mortified that the parent was actually talking about them, <laughs> but also sort of interested <laughs> in what your answer was, you know, but the parents were happy to ask the questions for them at that point. Like, well, how, what are they going to do? So you know, I, some of the basics, I always say, you know, go to college, you know, that's, that's a, that's a must, you should go to college, and you don't have to go to a college in Florida or Hawaii to work with marine mammals, you should go to a college that, that interests you, and that is a good fit for you, and those are, you know, only you can decide how that works, and then you should study something that's related to, you know, the care of animals, whether it's, it doesn't have to be marine uh, mammalogy per se. There's most of the people I know that are in the marine mammal training field don't have a degree or didn't start out with a degree in marine mammalogy. You know, they usually have a biology degree or a zoology degree or even a psychology degree, or we even had an econ major who kind of just switched gears, you know, later on. Um, go to college and then, you know, get kind of what you were alluding to, Meg. This is a long road. Um, get whatever kind of animal experience you can uh, for for whatever stage of life or, or career you're you're in. Um, I know it's sort of that catch twenty two. Well, how do I get a job working with marine mammals if I can't get you know any experience working with marine mammals? But you know, get some get some experience working with animals in general, and that's you know those are good skills that you can will carry over into the marine mammal field and then. Learn what you can about marine animals and also training. You know, now there's great resources out there. Um, I'll mention it right now. I'll give a plug for IMATA, the International Marine Animal Trainers Organization. It's an awesome 
uh, organization. It's been around for a long time, lots of resources there. Um, you can learn a lot. They have a website you can join as a student um, if you're not yet in the field, um, but lots to learn and, and, and lots, lots of connections for you to make about you know, possible future careers. So. Yeah, those are great. And I think I think the point you both make is that there's really not one direct pathway to becoming an animal trainer or a marine mammal trainer. There's there's a lot of different ways to get there, but all of them really involve a combination of education and hands-on experience. So those are always going to be an important part of whatever career you go path you go down when it comes to animal training. So I think those are wise words that you all have shared here today. And thank you for sharing your knowledge and experience working with not only marine mammals, but all sorts of animals. So thank you for this today. Thank you to both of you. Thank you, Barbara. Thanks for having having us. This was fun. Time for your second secret word. And the secret word is rocket. All right, back to the program. Hey, do you like this podcast? I certainly hope so. It's free, awesome content about the coolest topics in the world, like animals, training, behavior, science, and the experts in these fields. The good thing about this podcast is the more this information is shared, the more animals benefit. The way you can help get this podcast to more people is by rating and reviewing it. A good review helps get it featured on searches. And guess what? Your good behavior gets noticed around here. We'll randomly pick a winner from all the reviews given to receive a free one-year membership to the online education program, AnimalTrainingFundamentals.com. And if you all are super participatory and do a lot of reviews, we will do this as often as four times a year. But if we don't get too many, maybe it's just a two times a year thing. We'll have to see how it goes. If you're not sure how to give a review, just go to AnimalTrainingFundamentals.com backslash podcast and look for the big green button for instructions. If you liked what you heard today, visit AnimalTrainingFundamentals.com for more quality content on animal training. You'll find courses, community, and extensive video examples from my consulting work around the world. We'd love to have you join our force-free family.